Lord, I just pray that you would just help us to fight a good fight, Lord, of faith. Not letting our flesh get involved, but just uh, warring in the spirit. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Amen. Okie doke. If you got a Bible, we're going to be in John, the first, first John, chapter 2. And I have an, another announcement I wanted to bring to your attention. Some of you have probably seen this. This was, um, there was a, a video on Laura Ingram, uh, Fox News, about Idaho. Did anybody see that? Talking about pornography literature, or literacy, excuse me, and, um, and the distribution of a literature, I guess. But... Uh, Anyway, it was the Idaho North Central Health District uh, that had uh, put it up uh, from a group called ETR, and I think that's part of it, or branch of Planned, Planned Parenthood, don't quote me on that, but, I, but what they, um, they were doing is wanting to um, incorporate this uh, pornography liter literacy into uh, the sex ed in the public schools. And so um, it has since been removed, okay? So I'm not going to show the video because we didn't have very good, very good, uh, I don't know what you call it, so I'm not technical. But, but it wasn't going to do good, and it's, it's, it's kind of a gross video anyway. But um, Greg English, bless his heart, he, 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 he printed this up, and this has actually some, some contacts, emails that you can email uh, some of our representatives and, and we ain't having it, right? We ain't having it. They're not going to throw uh, pornography in front of our kids. And, um, and we're not going to let them do that without standing up and, and pushing back. So um, please be praying for that. Um, I know um, it's coming, right? It's coming. And so we just need to just push, but do what we can. We'll do what we can. And, and Jesus said, occupy until I come. And that means stand at attention and stand up and be counted. So we're going to do that. And um, we don't have to be militant. We don't have to kill anybody. Um, but we can say, I disagree. And so uh, there's, there's, there's these, some of these back on the table. So you can grab those and, uh, and take a gander. And then also... Uh, Next week, our trusty Dylan um, Heckenbach is not going to be here, and they're going to have a quinceanera. Did I, did I say that right? Pretty close. And it doesn't get over till midnight, so it's a mad dash on that Sunday morning to get everything set up. So if you've if you got a strong back and a weak mind and are willing to put up some chairs, uh, show up around 9 o'clock or so. We're going to be tearing into it, so I uh, appreciate it. All right. Oh, if you ain't got your Bibles open, open them up. John, 1 John, chapter 2. Um, this guy, I love this guy. He was known as the disciple that Jesus loved. The disciple, the apostle of love, old John was. Now, John wasn't always that way. Now, uh, earlier we remember him and his brother James. They were called the sons of thunder. Bojinernes, or how do you say that word that Jesus called him? He says, you guys don't know, you know, because the people, they had gone in and shared the gospel and nobody received it. He said, can we call fire down from heaven and fry them? <laughs> That's how some of this makes you feel sometimes, right? Can we just fry them? And Jesus goes, no, you know not what spirit you are of, right? Um, and so John has grown in his walk with the Lord. I hope you've grown. If you're not growing, something's wrong. 
right? Something is terribly wrong if you're not growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a good chance if you're not growing, you're not self-feeding. Because coming here on Sundays, it's not enough, right? It is not enough. We need to daily seek the Lord, daily be in his word, daily seek him in prayer and talk to him and talk about him. And so as we looked last time, Jesus uh, gave us some, uh, or John, excuse me, gave us some instructions how we can stay right with God, that we probably should never say that we're without sin uh, because that's not true. Uh, we deceive ourselves, it says. But if we do sin, if we confess our sins, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, I have to do that quite often, right? I have to repent of things I've said. I have to repent of thoughts that I've had. Um, I have to repent of being lazy and being negligent and, and all those things. It's a the Christian walk is a lifestyle, and it's, a, um, it's really learning how to seek forgiveness from the Lord and to stay right with Him. And um, so we're just going to look at a, at a few verses here this morning. Let's, let's pray, and then we'll read uh, the first four verses of, of 1 John chapter 2. Father, thank you that um, you consider us your kids as we come and trust in you and trust in the Lord Jesus and the work that he's done for us, Lord. And so I just pray that uh, this morning you would speak to our hearts, Lord. And, and I just pray for our world. I pray for, um, Lord, just us to be salt and light, Lord. We know that uh, until that which it restrains is taken out of the way, Lord, and that, uh, that is defined as us. We're that one that restrains with your Holy Spirit working in our hearts and our minds, our lives, Lord. And so help us to, to restrain the evil and to be, be that salt and light until you come. And, um, and then, Lord, they can have it. And so I pray that you would uh, bless the word uh, this morning, God, that we would truly write it upon the pages of our heart. And that we would um, have our eyes wide open in uh, this spiritual battle that we're in. And God, that... Uh, we would never uh, grow weary of doing good, that we wouldn't grow lazy spiritually. I pray that you would just fan that flame, that fiery flame of your Holy Spirit in all of our hearts, and uh, do it even today in Jesus' name. Amen. So he says there in, in verse 1, my little children, these things I write to you so that, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but for the whole world. Now, by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And by this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Right? Some really simple instructions. I like John starts out with little children. And the, the, the story goes that John would come into these towns. He would stand up in front of the congregation, an old, old, old man, right? The oldest one of the apostles. He's the one that lived the longest. And... Uh, some believe that that was a fulfillment of prophecy that Jesus said when him and Peter were bantering. When he, remember when Peter asked him, he asked Peter three times, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And, and then Peter finally goes, but, but what about him? <laughs> Lord, what about John? What's, what's he got to do? And, and remember what Jesus said to him? And I think this is so, so much us. We look at our other people all the time and see what the Lord's doing in their life. And you're going, well, how come him? And why not me? And, and uh, how come you called me to do this, Lord? And all this suffering. And, and the Lord told Peter, he says, Peter, I told you to follow me. You follow me. If I want John to stay here till I come back, well, that's none of your business. You follow me. So that's just the Lord saying, keep your nose out of everybody else's business and just mind your own. Right? I'm serious. If you mind your own business, you'll have plenty to do. You won't have time to worry about others pe other people's business. And so he's, uh, 
And he would just stand up and say, little children, love one another. And then he'd sit down. Right? That was his whole sermon. Little children, love one another. Right? So simple. So simple. But when it comes to loving each other, we all have got issues. Right? Now, most of us can say, well, hey, it's loving God, that's, that's cool. It's loving all these other people. It's just so hard. Right? They're prickly. They're kind of like a porcupine. Can't get too close. And so he, uh, he tells us the reason. He says the reason, right, the reason there that he's writing, he says, I write these things, I write to you so that you may not sin. God's pretty concerned about sin. Right now, sin was, they, they say, uh, was an old archer's term that when you missed the mark, it was a sin. The mark, the bullseye, right? You missed, you missed by a hair breadth that was sin. You turned around and shot the other way, it was sin, right? We've all sinned and, sh- and fallen short of the glory of God, but, but God's concerned with it, obviously. It motivated him, him to send his son here to die in place, to to be that payment for your sin and mine. And, 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 and it's kind of like a, a, a slithering snake, right, that can creep in unawares or aware, and we just think, oh, I got it handled. I got a handle on it. How many people you talk to that has issues? They could have issues with pornography or alcohol or drugs. Oh, I got it handled. I got a handle on it. No, it's got a handle on you, right? Kind of like some... Some snake stories that I'm heard I'm going to share with you. I'm going to share a snake story with you. I have these dreams about snakes. They're terrible. <laughs> Anybody ever had a snake dream where you're going, oh, I can, and you can't get away from them. And they're all around you, right? And they're going to eat you, right? Well, this happened. This is a, these are true stories. This happened in San Diego in 1996. Mary Ann Carter, who, is, who was eight months pregnant, woke up about 10 o'clock in the morning to find Kalina, it's a very nice name, a Burmese python wrapped around her stomach and biting her buttocks. <laughs> Said the police spokesman Bill Robinson, her husband, Brad, tried to free her using a small knife, but he too became ensnared. Then a neighbor joined in, no luck. We used a crowbar to try to get its mouth off her. We had a good 15-minute struggle. It was two grown men, and we weren't getting nowhere with it. Paramedics were summoned, and they finally used a hacksaw to remove the animal's head and released its grip, Robinson said. City regulations prohibit snakes as do not prohibit snakes as pets, although reptiles probably should be kept in a cage. You screw around with sin, it's going to bite you in the buttocks. Now, sometimes we scoff and we make light of certain things. I've done that in my own life, made light of certain things. And uh, just, just so you know, when you make light of sin, I don't care how small it is, it's wicked. Making light of it is wicked. It's evil, right? And sin, we know, is what? It's deadly. It's deadly. The wages of sin is death. Now, the Bible talks about sins that are unto death. My older brother committed one of those sins that was unto death, right? It killed him. His sin killed him. I'm going to go do a speak at a funeral here in a week or so friend of mine, he's almost 10 years younger than me, died of alcoholism. His sin killed him. It's deadly, right? It, 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 it tears you down uh, physically, emotionally, socially, interpersonally, spiritually. Sin does. And so John's saying, I'm writing this to you that you might not sin, that you would take serious this life that you live and to move away, divert yourself from a life of sin. 
But we don't like it. We, 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 we want a pet. We want a, we want a pet sin, right? We want a pet sin. Which leads me to my next st- snake story that's not quite as humorous. 1998 in Dallas, Texas, a seven-month-old infant girl was bitten and crushed to death by a family pet, an eight-foot-long reticulated python. Authorities said Sunday the infant was squeezed to death by the powerful reptile. The the asphyxiation process may have taken five minutes or longer, authorities said, and the snake prevented the baby from screaming by squeezing the breath from her lungs. The victim was Tony Lynn... Dubow, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Robert Eugene Dubow, who purchased the snake as a family pet a year and a half ago in California. Her five-year-old sister, Jessie, was, was sleeping in a bed in the same room but escaped injury. Mrs. Dubow discovered the infant Saturday a short time after the snake struck. She notified her husband, who found the snake curled up on a wooden shelf above the baby's crib. Authorities said Dubow became hysterical, grabbed a 70-pound python and wrestled it into the room, bedroom. He stabbed it with a knife and then shot it with a 25 caliber pistol, pistol, then partially severed the head with a kitchen knife and threw the snake back into the room with the dead child. Where police found it, the da- Dallas county medical examiner found uh, office ruled death by traumatic asphyxiation and said the child's body bore countless face and head bite marks. The smothering aspect answered my questions about why the parents didn't hear the, the child cry, said the spokesman with the medical examiner's office. She couldn't. As the victim tries to breathe, the snake squeezes tighter and tighter around the body. The medical examiner's field, uh, the field agent, Bill Lynn, said puncture wounds on the baby's face and head matched the snake's fangs. He said pythons leave no bruises on their victims. They smother by tightening their coils each time a victim exhales, preventing an inhalation. Dallas Police Homicide Sergeant Gus Rose and Dubow informed officers he fed the python a hamster every two weeks. He said it had been two weeks since he had fed. Rose said it could have been hungry. That's sin for you right there, right? It will eat you up. It will constrict and you won't even cry out sometimes. I write this to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, at this point, everybody should say amen, right? We have a snake killer, right? Jesus is that snake killer that will come along and he'll step in for you and me, and he will be that advocate. I like uh, the definition of this word advocate, right? It, uh, it's a defender, helper. It's actually in the Greek, it's the word paraclete. It's the paraclete that, that uh, John talks about in his gospel. And Jesus said, I will send a helper, the one who will come alongside. That's what a paraclete means. It comes alongside and it helps you ward off this, this constricting life of sin and death. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what the the advocate does um, because sin is uh, so powerful and and it will it will kill us. Jesus addressed sin to people. I, I, I hear people all the time tell me, well, Jesus is just love, right? Jesus just loves us. If we sin, that's okay. No, it's not. It's not okay. These lifestyles that people are saying are, oh, God's cool. You know, Jesus loves everybody. We're not under the law anymore, really. You are if you're doing those things. If you're doing those things, you're under the law. And this is what he gives us a list. And this is in the New Testament, by the way. Because I got accosted here last week when I had a little bantering with a a couple about 
homosexuality. And uh, actually, it wasn't even that. It was transgender. They went to homosexuality. I didn't go there. They went there. And, um, you know, and I quoted a, a verse out of the Old Testament, and they said, the Old Testament is just that. It's old. So does that mean all the Old Testament is irrelevant or just that one verse, right? And so you remember the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, right? And no doubt she was probably set up, but she still did it, right? She was caught in the very act, right? She was caught in the bed. And she comes and they go, all right, Jesus, hey, Moses tells us she's caught in the very act. She says, Stoner, what do you say? And they were, you know, they were, they were playing is what they were doing. So Jesus throws it back on him like he does. He's so good. I wish I was as smart as Jesus. Right? He throws it back on him. He goes, all right, he who was without sin, you cast the first stone. Right? And then he stoops back down on the ground and starts writing again. And you wonder, what does he write? Because they leave from oldest to youngest. Was he indicting all of them by name? Or maybe it was a certain name he was writing that would bring back memories? You know, you, you, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Any of you who lived kind of in, in darkness, right, under a rock? That was me. I hear people's names. And, oh. and then I see them. That's even where I, most of the time when I see them, <laughs> please forgive me. I was lost when I knew you, right? And... Uh, it's shocking. But so everybody leaves. Obviously, Jesus convicts them. You're all guilty. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody has arrived. And then the, the, he looks at the woman. He looks at the woman. And he, where are your accusers? I have none, Lord. He said, neither do I accuse you. Do you remember what he said? Go and sin no more. Right? That's the instruction. When you come to Jesus... You will not stop sinning. I don't think you stop sinning to the day you die. But you sin less and less and less as you grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. And then there's the other story there in John chapter 5 at the pool of Bethesda. You remember? He heals the guy. There's a lot of people. Kind of gets lost in the crowd. And they're going, hey, dude, what are you doing? You're carrying your bed. You're walking around. And he says, well, he who, he who told me to take up my bed and walk, he... He, uh, it's his fault. And so he says, uh, so Jesus sees him, hey, he says, you're healed. He said, yes. Yes, Lord. And he tells him, he says, you go and you sin no more or else, or else something worse may came, come upon you. Right? Or else. So, yeah, the Lord has an issue with sin. Right? He tells us, don't do it. Don't do it. But if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Amen. And thank you, Lord. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God helps us. When you cry out and ask for help, God will help you. He is that, that ready advocate. We, we are all guilty of capital crime. Did you get that? We are all guilty of capital crime. That means you commit a crime that is worthy of death. And who hasn't done that? When you look at Jesus' commentary on the law, right, we're all guilty. What was an adulterer's uh, penalty? It was death, right? They killed him. What was somebody who committed murder, right? You kill somebody, you forfeit your right to live. Didn't mean that they didn't have an opportunity to repent and get right with God, right? Which is awesome. But we're all guilty. Jesus said, you have heard, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you call him an idiot or a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. David Guzik, in his commentary on this, talks about a, a defense lawyer, right? It's kind of like a defense lawyer. Jesus goes to bat for you. He says this, It is as if we stand as the accused in the heavenly court, you and I, before our righteous judge, God the Father. 
Our advocate stands up to answer the charges. He is completely guilty, Your Honor. What? In fact, he has even done worse than what he is accused of and now makes full and complete confession before you. Right? Doesn't that go along with the last chapter? If we confess. The gavel slams. The judge asks, what should his sentence be? Your ad, our advocate answers, his sentence shall be death. He deserves the full wrath of the righteous court. All along, our accuser, Satan, is having a great, has, has great fun at all of this. We are guilty. We admit our guilt. We see our punishment. But then our advocate asks to approach the bench. As he draws close to the judge, he simply says, Dad, this one belongs to me. I paid his price. I took the wrath and punishment from this court that he deserves. The gavel sounds again, and the judge cries out, guilty as charged, penalty satisfied. Our accuser starts going crazy. Aren't you even going to put him on probation? No, the judge shouts, the penalty has been completely paid by my son. There is nothing to put him on probation for. Then the judge turns to our advocate and says, son, you said this one belongs to you. I release him into your care. Case closed. Amen? Right? That's our advocate. That's our advocate. That's Jesus Christ, the righteous one, right, who defends us, who he paid it all. It's almost cliche sometimes because we hear it so much, and we even sing that song, Jesus paid it all. But it's so true. It's so true. Not only that, No one knows the law like Jesus. Nobody. Not only does nobody know the law like Jesus, but Jesus is in fact the law. Christ is the law. He was the word of God incarnate. He tells us there in Matthew chapter 5, verse starting in verse 17, he says, listen, do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, Jesus knows the law. better than you and I do. He knows when you're guilty and when you're not. That's why the the man there in in Luke 18 pound on his chest. He knew what he was. He knew that God knew what he was. And that's, I think that's the disconnect, folks. A lot of times we don't think God knows what we are because we don't know what we are. We think we're we're a pretty good, I'm a good person. No, you're not. There There is not a good person in this room. Did you hear me? There is not a good person in this room because they called Jesus good and he said, you stop right there. Why do you call me good? You think I'm just a good man? We talked about that last time, right? Lunatic, Lord, or liar. You're not good. I'm not good. He is good. And if you don't align yourself with the good one, the God man, you're not good. There is no goodness in you. Nor is there anyone. Do you remember what Jesus said? There is none good but one, God. That's who's good. Not you and I. And that's why we need him. Because listen, Christ calls us to a life of obedience. And if you don't want to be obedient to him, it's almost, it, it, it feels like, now I'm not dogmatic on this, but it feels like you're sliding back under the law because you're thinking way too highly of yourself. Paul talks about it in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 10. Listen to this. Listen, please listen to this. 
we know that the law, the law of God, is good to one who uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels. Okay, stop right there. The law is not made for the righteous. Now, are you righteous? If you're in Christ, yes, you are. If you're in Christ, you're righteous. There is a goodness and a righteousness transferred to your life from Him. It's not yours. So that's why I can say that there is no one good, no, not one, along with what Scripture says, right? But if you are in Christ, you are righteous. So then, as He goes on in this list, you are disqualified from being guilty of these things because you're righteous if you're in Christ. So he says, he goes on, he says, not made for the righteous, the law wasn't made for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, or for murderers, for sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary. Contrary to sound doctrine. Now, this is the New Testament here. And so, we're to move away from those things. And in 1 Corinthians, he tells us, and so were some of you. Some of you were guilty of these things. I was guilty. I was guilty of almost all of them. And then I came to Jesus. Jesus. And he very slowly started cleaning me up. Did I quit doing everything right off the bat? No. But as I get older, I sin a little bit less than I used to. And that's kind of the sanctification process as we're heading towards seeing him face to face. Do you hunger for that? Right? Because it's coming. It's, it's coming. You know, the Bible says nobody knows the day of the hour. I was looking at this last week, just a little side note here. I was looking at this last week. Here, next week, next week starts uh, uh, the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, the Feast of, Feast of Trumpets, it depends on who you listen to. It's either the 25th or 26th of September. And it goes clear to Yom Kippur. That's 10 days, right? The Feast of Trumpets is usually just a couple days, but it starts the celebration that it culminates in 10 days with Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. Nobody knows the day of the hour. I'm telling you, I'm not saying Jesus is coming back next week, but I'm saying he could, so you better be looking up, right? Be looking up. Be ready. And so he tells us, right, he calls us into a life of obedience. Because he hates sin, God is wrathful. God is wrathful towards sin. He's wrathful. He poured out all of his wrath on Jesus for our sin. Ephesians 5, verses 5 and 7, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Right? Be careful who you hang out with. Bad company corrupts good morals, the Bible says. Who are you hanging with? What kind of pets you got in your house? You ain't got no pythons, do you? Hope not. Be careful what you let in. Be careful who you let in into your life. Romans chapter 5 verse 9 says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? through him. God's wrathful towards sin. And he's really going to be wrathful towards those who are sin who will not come to Christ. Right? We read it in the Revelation. The blood runs bridle deep on a horse for 200 miles. He's going to pour out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting sinful world that will not receive him. And so he calls us to that life of obedience, which brings us to verse 2, where it says, 
And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That word propitiation. Okay, did I say it right, Dara? <laughs> I, I would say propitiation. That's not right. It's propitiation. It depends on who you talk to. It depends on where you're from, Right? He himself is our propitiation. This is what it, what it means in the Greek. An offering, listen to this, an offering to appease an angry, offended party. Right? An offering to appease an angry, offended party. See, God's not mad at people per se. He's mad at sin. That's what fires him up. It's, it's, it's behavior. Have you heard this? Well, well, I was born this way. Yes, you were. And you need to repent of the way you were born. Right? I was born that way. Desperately wicked, perverse, selfish, a thief, a liar, all those things. When I, when I came to Christ, I, we all come the same way, right? I had to come and repent. God, forgive me for my selfish life. Because obviously that is... That is an, an evidence that you've turned, is when you turn from being selfish to you desire a, a selflessness. It's a great witness. He's that the ultimate payment for our sin. Verses 3 and 4. Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments... He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Right? Truly the love of God is perfected in him. So what does it mean to keep his commandments? You mean we've got to keep all 613 Hebrew laws? No, if you look at the Hebrew law, right, it breaks down very nicely into three categories. There was the dietary laws, there was the ceremonial laws, and there was the moral laws, or some call it the civil law and the uh, religious law and the moral law. Now, what we read in 1 Timothy is the moral law, right? That's morality. It's, it's behavior, the behavior of humans. Do we have to keep all those? No. We're not under the law. We're not under the ceremonial or the religious law, right? The, 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 the food laws seem to be dealt with there in, in Acts when Peter sees the sheet come down, right? The, the temple was torn. The ceremonial law, how you came to God in the temple, that temple was, that veil was torn that was in the temple. And so the Jews don't have a temple today. So what law is he talking about? Uh, how about the Ten Commandments? That's a moral law, right? Now, I have a hard time, I, I have a hard time even remember, I, and I know it's in two categories, have a hard time remembering. I can't remember the 613. I have a hard time remembering the 10. But Jesus was kind and gracious enough to us, you guys, to narrow it down to two. Two laws. I can remember those, right? I, that's that's uh, me being limited. I can remember put those to memory, and so can you, right? And so it was, it was there in, in, um, in Matthew that they come to Jesus, and they ask him, right? Uh, so one of the lawyers asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, with all your mind. And the it, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Really simple. Love God, love people, and you, there's proof positive that you walk with Jesus. Really simple. Now, it's not always easy. And so it goes from 613 to the Ten Commandments, which is many believe is for all people for all time. And then you have the two in Matthew. Love God, love people. Jesus said they will know, they will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. And so 
What, what does God do with people who won't obey, who won't obey him, who won't, won't even obey these two commandments? I don't know, but I know they're in a scary place, right? They might be on thin ice. And so God's proof is love. It's love. It's simple. Now, it's not easy. It's easy to love God. But I think I mentioned it last week. It's not that easy to love people. I remember hearing a quote from Mahatma Gandhi that said, It is not Jesus that I have a problem with. It is his people. Right? Gandhi liked. But how do you love people? I think it's, it's not easy, but it's doable. I don't know how many of you watched, and I'll, I'll close with this. I don't know how many of you watched the, um, the podcast that, that Rick did with a guy named um, David Guzik, or excuse me, David Eubanks, uh, this uh, last week. It was when I got home from church last week, I watched it. And David is the free Burma Rangers. He is kind of the one that headed up that ministry. They go into Burma. He's trained um, some of the Burmese people because they've been in civil war for 73 years. And they just go into, they go into little villages and they'll just wipe everybody out. Men, women, children. They just kill everything and everybody. And, um, and David, you know, he's got to operate on the fly a lot, right? He's got to operate because he's moving and sometimes ducking a lot of bullets and, um, he said, I, I operate in love. He said, I pray. God, what, how, how do I love these people? He tells a story of going into Iraq, and the, the U.S. had just flew a, a bombing mission to destroy ISIS. And he said that, he said, the U.S. is usually pretty good. He says, they're usually spot on, right? And um, he said, but they killed ISIS, but then there was a house right next door and killed everybody in the house. I think it killed eight people. And... And he went over there, and he didn't know. He says they were angry. They were broken. They were, and he just kept saying he was sorry. He said, I said I was sorry over and over again. He says, these people, these pilots that, that, that flew this mission, they're probably in their 30s. They probably have children. They, they, they didn't mean to kill your family. And he said, Lord, what do I do? And he said it was just like the Lord just gave him this peace. And he got on his knees, and he lifted his hand. And he said, I, he says, I have a pistol right here. He says, you can take my life. He said, I don't have time to go tell my wife and kids goodbye, but I will give you my life if it will help. But that's all I can give you is my life. And so one of the brothers that was great big guy walks up over to him, picks him up off the ground, and he says, we do not hate you. And he said, they both just burst into tears. See, that's love. That's what God calls me, you and me to. It is to, to lay down our life. He said he was, he was, he says, you can, you can kill me. You can take my life. That took some brass. Right? Thinking that those, those Arabs probably weren't too fond of him. And he goes into a Burmese village where this woman had lost her two brothers. They cut their throats and they threw them in a well. And they'd been there for five months. And she comes running out and she's, she's crying. And she says, can you go get them for me? And he goes, Lord, what do I do? And he said, the Lord said, love them. It's loving to go down on that well and try to retrieve those bodies. Five months. They were so decomposed, they'd actually put a pump down. It was 20 feet of water. They put a pump down and pumped it down to three feet and then put him down on a rope. And he carried down a rice sack with him. And he called up. He says, I found two skulls. Ask her if that's enough. And he put the skulls in the rice bag. And they pulled him out, and it was enough. She had closure. I, I'm going to encourage you to watch it, because if it doesn't fire you up, you're dead, right? You don't have a soul if that doesn't fire you up. That's, this, is, this is who we're talking about here. We're talking about this one who can inspire us to do the unthinkable, to do the most selfless acts we could ever even imagine in our mind, and Jesus can move you to do it. This guy said, I'm not, he said, I'm scared. I cry. I, I'm scared all the time. But I know that God's with me, right? 
Wasn't that great theologian John Wayne <laughs> that said, courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway, right? Courage is being scared to death and, and going for it. I hope that you want to love like Jesus. And we can practice by loving each other. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and Lord, how you move in the lives of your people. Lord, that we're all flawed. We know that. I pray that you would help us be in a place, Lord, where we unconditionally love you and love one another. That we would fully, truly and fully live a, a life, Lord, that is obedient to our God. Lord, John calls us little children for a reason. And children are, are inspired and, and commended and commanded to love their parents and to listen to them. So help us to listen to you, to have ears to hear, Lord, in these times in which we live. Lord, I pray that you would help us to lift up our heads, Lord, that we would pray for the the crazy things going on in our, in our state of Idaho and, and around the world, Lord. And God, that you would just bring us sanity and that you would uh, put those words in our mouths and in our hearts to share with those around us that people would be inspired and encouraged to turn to you with all their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.